by Michael Barron, um, and it's with Robert Rollins, Tasman Vandenberg, and Matthew Woolhouse. Um, thank you, Mike. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, so I'm Michael Barone. Uh, all of my slides are available online, so if you want to jump on the computer, it's Wi-Fi access here. You can join in with the slides. I have some data that's interactable, so you can play with it right from the slides. Um, so very briefly about me, I'm a, I was a psychology undergraduate. I'm now a Master of Science candidate in psychology at McMaster as of Tuesday. Whoa. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, Anyway, All of this work has been done since then. Yes. <laughs> oh, <I'm sorry. laughs> um, so we've been talking some about some cog stuff, some new stuff. This is a little more on the social science side, but it's cognitive as well. Uh, so I hope you guys find it uh, interesting. I'm going to be briefly talking about some past research that uh, kind of fueled this exploration done by Matthew and Jyoti. It's a published work. Uh, and then kind of jump into the topic that we moved into from that work, uh, this idea of cultural omniversity. It's a strange word, but I'll explain it. Uh, and then our hypothesis for what we were testing. I'll briefly describe how we tested it, how we collected everything, how we calculated everything, and then move into results. Okay, so um, you've heard about this Digital Music Lab. We're a small army here today. and. Uh, We've been doing this work with consumption and music preference, genre transitions. It all comes from this database that was gifted to us by Mix Radio, which is a service very similar to Pandora. Uh, they give us about 1.3 billion download records, and the service is available in 33, we say regions. Uh, it's like countries mostly, but some are joined together for one reason or another. Um, 17 million users, there's about 14 million unique tracks downloaded. We have about 37 million within our database, so that gives you kind of a sense of how much people download and what they're downloading. And the year range for this sample is between 2007 to about uh, September 2007 to September 2014. Um, so the past research that Joe T. and Matthew looked at when they first received this data set uh, was looking at when people are downloading around the world. Do they download at different times? different places. Are they downloading like at midnight every day or are they always downloading on weekends? Is it across the week? When are people downloading? Uh, and they found that uh, it obviously depends. It's not just like time zone. It's not necessarily just culture where you know people might download on the weekend here but our weekends are different than let's say the weekends in a Middle Eastern country where you know Islamic country where their weekends start on Thursday. Uh, but we found that regardless of that, people do download, or countries, people within these uh, countries download at different patterns based on something called uh, HDI. But really, uh, what H I'm going to go into a little bit of what HDI is later, but what you need to know about HDI for this graph basically is that it's a measure of human well-being, and it measures uh, well-being on a couple of statistics. Uh, but we find that specifically when it comes to income, people download uh, more sporadically throughout the week. And what that really means is that people download, if, they, if that this specific country has a higher income, they typically download more on specific days, the weekends. Whereas if income is a little lower, the download pattern is sporadic. It's dispersed throughout the week. And there's some practical reasons for this. Um, Partially because if you have countries with higher income, more of those people typically have jobs where they can't listen to their music whenever they want, so their leisure time becomes their consumption time. Uh, whereas in countries with a lower income, they're doing a lot more unpaid work where they have the liberty to listen to what they want when they want. So you see this kind of like dispersion. So what this graph really shows, the x-axis here is HDI, a higher HDI means better income, better wellness or well-being. Uh, and the y-axis is dispersion across week. So a uh, higher dispersion across the week represents that they're downloading on very specific days more. Whereas if it's a lower dispersion, it's just more, it's dispersed across the week. So what we see from this research is that uh, there's, there's, a, there's more nuance there, but at a very high level, income is influencing when we are downloading. 
Uh, so we took this, this was really interesting work for us. Uh, we thought, uh, what other things can we ask using similar kind of measures? And what we wanted to look at was, okay, people are downloading when differently. What if they're downloading some what differently? So maybe they're down or listening to different music in different countries using with method or using statistics similar to this. So when we started to look at the research, uh, we came across this idea of cultural omniversity. And really what cultural omniversity means is art consumption or expression. Um, it doesn't have to be music, it can be theater, it can be art, it can be dance, uh, any kind of art. Uh, and the basic theory is quite similar to, is, uh, how familiar are people with Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Mostly, yeah, we got some, okay, good hands. So very simple, yeah. So when, you're, when your lower needs are met, you got your food, your shelter, you're comfortable, uh, your desires, your goals, your, um, your wishes become a little more esoteric. They become personal and about how you want to live your life as opposed to just getting through it. Um, previously in our cultures, music and art was used as a way to stratify us, to separate the high class and the low class. At least this is what the sociological and social science research has been saying for some time. But, I mean, we all listen to music online, right? Uh, you, don't, you can't stratify people in music anymore. You can maybe stratify them on like the actual uh, concerts that they go to because it's expensive, but mostly people have almost complete access to music if they, if they so choose. So you can't stratify them based on this. So the argument is that in this transition period, people or this, this stratification is changing so that it's no longer, well, you can't listen to that. It's, I listen to a lot of stuff. I listen to more than you. So it kind of it goes away from the snob versus slob dichotomy and moves into um, people, higher status people are becoming more eclectic. And this is a way to, according to their research, to stratify people. And there's some support for this. Um, uh, more than just this paper, there's about a series of, of 10 papers that look at omniversity uh, and how, and like their kind of social demographic statistics and how omnivorous are they. Uh, they do find that individuals, at least in, in, this, in this study in England, with higher education and higher income have more, are more omnivorous. They're consuming many different types of music, uh, but specifically theater and dance in here. So that's where we wanted to, briefly, sorry. Will you speak briefly on some means of quanti quantifying the omnivorosity or omnivorosity? Yeah, we call omnivorosity. Uh, yes, absolutely. I'm gonna quanti I'll describe how we quantify it, but I'm also gonna describe how they quantify it. Uh, not this next slide, but the slide right after. Uh, following this hypothesis, if we were to look at like music downloads, you would probably suggest, think that higher education or higher income, if this theory is true, equals high omniversity. Therefore, uh, you would expect higher diversity in music downloads. So with that hypothesis though, we have to improve on methodology, uh, specifically because the methodology of the past cultural omnivore work uh, is a little lacking. Uh, so uh, Peterson here, actually contributed to a lot of omniversity research. Uh, and he has a paper out there that describes some of the problems with it. So how they describe omniversity, uh, or cultural omniversity in general, was used uh, in most of these studies on less than five countries, which is problematic. It's tough to talk about global effects when you don't have a country that represents is represented on every continent, right? Um, their omniversity measures were based purely on concert and theater attendances. So they would ask, they have these people go to a concert or go to a, a dance, a theater uh, experience and ask them some questions afterwards, like how much money do you make, what's your education and that kind of stuff. And they found that the people that were going to more different, more concerts had higher education, higher income, more different types of concerts. Uh, but another problem with this research is they usually have like only about four genres for music or any of their other omniversity measures, we know that music is pretty colorful. It's more than just three or four main genres. It's this wide spectrum. So quantifying omniversity on those kind of limited measures is, is problematic, right? Um, second, well, fourthly, I guess, they uh, measure human well-being differently. All these studies, 
mean, within within uh, researchers, they they maintain some consistency, but researchers in other labs and other places around the world are not measuring the same thing in the same way. So convergent evidence is a little difficult because the measurement tool is different and not the same even within a lot of the studies. Um, and I briefly talked about this uh, a couple slides ago about the digital age and culture. They talk about it, but they don't really provide anything in terms of what they would expect to find. I mean, they, they say it's, well, it's because of this change in stratification strategies, but uh, they don't really look at how it's happening or provide any sort of, you know, further look at this. So armed with this, we took our human development index stuff, which I'm gonna describe right now, and we measured omniversity against HDI. So HDI, very briefly, is a composite statistic. It's measured by the UN every year. Sometimes, well, in past years, they haven't always posted it, but they're doing it every year now. It's based off of three factors that are supposed to be basically culturally neutral. So they don't have, human well-being isn't measured may not be measured the same for an individualistic country as it would be for a collectivist country. So they try to chop a lot of that kind of stuff out. So it's based off of three things, human well-being. How healthy the country is or how healthy people are in that country, how educated they are, and how much money that country is making. There's many different types of kind of derivations of this index that measure different subtleties. Obviously this is kind of heuristic, right? It doesn't, can't possibly cover everything. So, but we use this and we use the factors within it to then test against omniversity. We calculate omniversity within our uh, database uh, for this experiment in two ways. Uh, the first way I'm going to describe really quickly and then the second way I'm going to describe in more detail, it's similar to the first way, so we'll uh, use that as our case study or an example, okay? So the first thing we did is we looked at omniversity in aggregate at the country level. So we took the top 10 most downloaded genres in each country, converted those into proportions, calculated the standard deviation of that proportional data, and then compared those SDs to that country's HDI for every year that we could find, but well, that was within our set. So we had about four years of HDI information that we could then correlate to this. Uh, for the user level though, it's, it's similar in terms of these steps, but just slightly different. So that's why I'm gonna go into this one a little more and then there's kind of like a step five a little bit for the user level stuff. So just bear with me and I'll explain it. So the first thing we do for the user level analysis is very similar to the country level, rather than collecting all the downloaded genre, the top 10 gen downloaded genres for a country, we just collect the genres downloaded for each user. Okay, so I have two user uh, play histories here. One is uh, supposed to be less omnivorous. We got four rock songs and one folk song, and this one is supposed to be much more omnivorous. Now you've seen that, you've seen there. Do you guys know the movie Star Wars? Never heard of it? Episode one, you know, the, the classic thing. Matthew actually sung in that, so it was, it, it, to me, like, he doesn't want me to admit it, but I think that's the coolest thing ever. So I had to just bring that up. And so John Williams helped him on that piece, so <laughs> make, sure to, make sure to thank Matthew. Uh, anyway, so we have these play histories. Uh, we then convert these into proportions. So you obviously see here, Rock is at 80% uh, of the downloads versus 20 and our user two here is 20% across the board. So we calculate the standard deviation for each of these users. And you'll notice that uh, users that are less omnivorous um, have a higher standard deviation. So what we're going to predict is that HDI is negatively correlated with omniversity. The more HDI you have, or not omniversity, but standard deviation, pardon me. So higher your HDI, the lower your standard dev should be, okay? Uh, so it's a little bit counterintuitive, but it does make sense. We have these examples here. Um, so to do this at the user level now, rather than just the country where we take the top 10 genres and that SD is there, we take the standard deviation of this for every user in that country and then take the median value. The reason why we take the median value is a lot of you, we, we have some restrictions in terms of how many songs the user must download but we also 
like there there's it helps reduce the the tail so there's if you have a little overfit or overfitting on the other end uh, you get that nice uh, middle value so it's less susceptible to variance so if we looked at the median value for each country each country had at least like 5,000 users as a sample China had hundreds of thousands uh, so it was a pretty robust sample certainly compared to a lot of the research uh, prior uh, so very quick methods uh, so our database is stored in a relational system. I used iterative queries with Python uh, to take the data that I needed, and I ran my analysis and some visualization in R, and then some JavaScript, which you'll see in a second for visuals. So um, I'm going to actually just uh, pop this out and just look at it from here, just a little, a little nicer right now. So what did we find? First thing we found this is the uh, country level genre um, statistics. So I'm just going to remove some data here. There's three lines for income, education, and HDI. So we looked at the omniversity for all for these for the 30 or so countries that we have in our database, and then uh, looked at their estimates. So we found that there is a significant correlation for both income, education, and HDI as a whole but not health, which is great because we weren't really expecting health to be correlated with how omnivorous you are necessarily, probably more in line with the past research income and education. So we, there's some support for that there. Um, we have, here's the education values. So the R square was fairly small for this at 0.138 and then HDI 2010 in general is here. So if you go on the website, you can look at each individual country and it tells you what stat you're using, especially if you want to like put two together. So when we looked at user level statistics, we find similar support and actually slightly stronger support specifically for income. Um, this, so this is the user level omniversity measures. Uh, we find stronger support uh, for this omniversity effect uh, with this, uh, with this level of analysis. Um, R square for income is at 0.23, education being at 0.15 here, all of which are significant, but just, just barely for education here. So it seems to be that income is a little bit stronger for measuring this than just education alone. But I mean, the two are related, like countries that make more money are also able to invest more into education for their children well. So it's not necessarily clear whether it's, I mean, it's both education and income, but it's not necessarily clear from this that it's one or the other. It might just be income that's uh, influencing it the most at the moment. Uh, and lastly, the, the data set that I pulled this information from was from a developer of site for the UN. So the, the JSON file that I, res that, I, that I took this stuff from had a bunch of other really cool stats. Uh, one of them was uh, enrollment ratios, primary, secondary, and tertiary enrollment ratios, as well as just gross, and ratio, gross enrollment ratios for both sexes in that country. So we find a positive correlation for primary enrollment ratio, which is would be weird, you'd expect the negative, but uh, that's probably due to how primary enrollment is calculated. Um, they calculate it based on like the expected number of students coming in and then how many actually do but students are more likely to repeat, repeat grades or you have more children coming into education or coming in later. So enrollment ratio is just a little tricky, but we do find an effect uh, for tertiary here and as well for combined growth. So we have some convergent evidence uh, using linear regressions that support this general finding. Uh, let me see here. So this is just like, table of all the results that we that we have with just the just the R value so you can kind of see the directionality. Primary enrollment is a uh, is a little is a little weird, but I think it's because of how it's collected and just what it actually represents. Um, so our results seem to support this cultural omnivore hypothesis, but we're using much different methods than the past work has and usually at much larger scales. So what I would like to do going forward with this is expand them, expand the data that we have. Uh, so we have like some HDI measures, we have some things about income, uh, some education stuff. There's, there's a lot of country level things that we could potentially
potentially look at that we just don't have lots of data for. So expanding, expanding those data sources would be really useful. Um, the other one would be, I mean, I say refine here, but I really mean refine and uh, have new meta-analysis procedures. So not just omniversity, but we can look at omniversity in maybe other ways. So I have our sex ratio here, but I'll start with release year just for now. Um, we can we think of genres in terms of taste and like rock is a genre, pop is a genre, but a lot of times decades are a genre as well. It's a loose genre, but we say like, oh, I like 60s, like 70s. So we could look at release year. When a song is released, our individual our, our, our individuals that are more omnivorous also listening to more like less time constrained music. Is it just in 2010 or so, or is it larger? So is there a larger SD? Or smaller SD for their release year. Uh, and lastly, artist sex ratio. We we're curious to see if there are any sex effects. Like, do some countries, for whatever reason, prefer male artists more than female artists? Uh, so that'd be a really interesting uh, thing to look at going forward. And like Music Brains and all these other APIs that we've been talking about a little bit today have that kind of information. And I'll actually be talking about. I have another talk at the right at the very end that talks about that kind of stuff. So. I'll go into that a little further in a little bit, but uh, thank you very much, guys. Hi. So, so you alluded to the, the genre uh, issues in the prior work, and you didn't really speak to whether you solved the problem, mm. just maybe that you're so we uh, got more genres to deal with, but I mean, just to briefly articulate the, the problem. It, it's, um, you know, maybe I, I, maybe I only listen to soul and fun, but um, there's a world of music there. And, 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 and you know, the, the person that comes up with these classification schemes then determines my omniverosity. Uh, exactly. So. Um, yes, and that's, that's definitely some future, like, the, our genre resolution data right now is at about 63 genres. Um, there are more advanced genre systems out there that we are trying to you know, set our system up in order to handle. Um, but yeah, I mean, genre is being classified by someone else. So sometimes there, there is some issues there. We feel that um, al although there are those limitations, it's certainly better than like less than four genres, right? It sounds so, a lot, I mean, the big, Issue is uh, it's like almost like an institutional kind of racism or something. <laughs> like it's a system where the, the wealthy set up the, the distribution channels, and um, I mean that was the wrong term. But I, mean, I know. Uh, <laughs> it, it seems like you need a rock solid argument against this, and maybe one argument is just uh, looking. In order to explore this hypothesis and really do it uh, justice, you know, maybe you need to look at ten different genre classification schemes and show you show that in all cases these trends hold up. Yeah, and, and pr preferably these classification schemes are not all done in North America. Yeah, yeah, I think I mean that's a that's a great point. Definitely a way to really solve that that genre issue because genres, at least within metadata here right now are kind of prescribed by wherever we get the data from, right? So, If I can just come in on that point. Um, the Obviously, Michael's uh, analysis is with, uh, with metadata, but we, we're in the process of linking through the Echo Nest uh, a lot of audio features to the tracks. And so one potential slightly more objective way, which is what I know what you're, you're grasping for of, of doing this, is at the audio feature level. To see whether there is a greater degree of variance uh, right. at the audio feature level yeah. Yeah. Um, with respect to HDI and the factors that comprise HDI and many other United Nations indices as well. Because yeah. they're a great thing about the United Nations, the United Nations, it's just a fantastic source of information. The number of different indices, and they go in and they religiously collect these year after year after year. So if you have global data, uh, it strikes me as being something of a no-brainer to try to see how it is intersecting with um, you know, digital music culture. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's 